Welcome to the Creek Road Baptist Pulpit. These weekly podcasts feature expository messages delivered to edify the soul. Now let's join Pastor Dave as he presents this week's message. So this week, we read our first week reading. We read from Genesis chapter 1, verse 1 to Genesis chapter 20. That's a lot of ground to cover. It really is. I'm proud of you guys because, I mean, almost half of the book of Genesis you've read this week. And boy, so much stuff. So this week in our reading, we passed over a great deal of time. We read it from the beginning of creation all the way up into the period of Abraham. So many significant events um, happen before we ever get to the King's Dale, and that's where we're going to be today in chapter 14. So if you have your Bible, you want to turn with me to chapter 14. This is the story of Abraham when he comes back from the slaughter of the king. So verses 17 through 24 today. But in our readings this week, we pass over the first three epochs of the, the history of of men. We've entered into the fourth epic, which is the time of the patriarchs. So we're reading now about Abraham. That's the time of the patriarchs. The first epic was the generations of creation. It began in Genesis 1-1 and went all the way to Genesis 3-21. And it ends with the angels coming after Adam and Eve are ejected from the garden. The angels come and they guard the way to the tree of life and the flaming sword. That's the first epic. It ends with that. Then we have the generations of Adam, beginning in Genesis 4-1 and going all the way through 6-4, and it ends with the flood. And the flood, of course, is recounted for us in Genesis 6-5 through 8-14. The third epic of the world begins with the generations of Noah and Shem, and that is Genesis 8-15 through 10-32, and it ends with the fall of the Tower of Babel in 11, 1 through 26. The fourth epic begins with Terah, the father of Abraham, and focuses on one family and how God is keeping his promise to Abraham. And that begins in Genesis eleven twenty-seven, 27, and it, go, it will go all the way until Exodus chapter 4, verse 31. And then it will end with the... Um, with the judgments on Egypt and the ejection of the children of Israel from Egypt. So each epic ends with some sort of a cataclysmic or a a significant event. And uh, so all of these are happening. We've read the majority of them. Um, And we're now in that fourth epic. And if you, you notice as you read your Bible how the Bible begins to narrow the focus each time, each epic, the Bible narrows the fir- focus a little further. So in Genesis, we have the creation of the garden and of all things, and Adam is placed there. And then when we get to the generations of Adam, we focus on the line of Seth. So in chapter 5, which begins the generations of Adam, you have Seth and his descendants. So you have all these other people, Cain, And his descendants, they're briefly listed, but we're focusing mainly on Seth and his descendants. And, of course, it names one son out of each one of these men, but it also says that they had other sons and daughters. But it names one. And so we're focusing each time, and the the focus is getting narrower and narrower until we come down to Shem and his descendants. Now Noah had three sons, Japheth and Ham and Shem, but we're focusing just on Shem. And that comes down to Terah. And then when we get to Terah, we're going to focus on, and he had other sons, but we're going to focus on Abram. And Abram is the one to whom the covenant is made. And then from Abram's time on, we are focusing strictly on the family of Abram, Abraham. His descendants, Jacob, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, and then the travail in Egypt, and then Moses, and then Joshua, and then we go into the period of the judges, 
but it's still just the family of Abraham, which now is a multitude by the time you get to Judges, and they're living in the land. And then we come to David, and then we begin to focus only on the family of David because he's a descendant of Abraham, but now it's just David that we're focusing on and his line because those are the line of the kings and we know what's going to happen out of David. We're going to find Messiah. He's going to come and, then it's, and that, of course, is the whole point. That is what the Bible is leading us up to. It's going to lead us up to Messiah and what he does and then, of course, the church is born and the New Testament from the time of the Gospels all the way through to the end focuses on the church, the bride of Christ. So we have, this, we have this focus beginning in Genesis and the narrowing and the narrowing and the narrowing until we get to Abraham and then we come to David and then we come to Messiah in the New Testament and the church is born. So all of this is happening. It's a beautiful panorama that we have. We can look forward to all the different a kaleidoscope colors that we're going to see in the scripture, but just remember that the focus and the point is we're leading up to something wonderful in Messiah. Today, we're here in chapter 14, and this is the time of the patriarchs, and we're talking about Abram. And so if you have your Bible there in chapter 14, we're going to begin our reading here in verse 17. And the king of Sodom went out to meet him after his return from the slaughter of Chedorlaomer and the kings that were with him at the valley of Sheva, which is the king's dale. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine, and he was the priest of the Most High God. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram of the Most High God, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be the Most High God, which hath delivered thine enemies into thy hand, and he gave him tithes of all. And the king of Sodom said unto Abram, Give me the persons and take the goods to thyself. And Abram said to the king of Sodom, I have lifted up mine hand unto the Lord, the most high God, the possessor of heaven and earth, that I will not take from a thread even to a shoe latchet, and that I will not take anything that is thine, lest thou should say, I have made Abram rich. Save only that which the young men have eaten, and the portion of the men which went with me, Aner, Eskel, and Mamre. Let them take their portion. The title of my message today is A Sodomite's Request. Let's begin with a little background information. First of all, if you look at verse 17, it says, And the king of Sodom went out to meet him. Now, the king of Sodom represents the group of kings who engaged the forces from the east. So Chedorlaomer and all those fellows come from the east. They come from the area of Mesopotamia. We'll talk about that in just a second. But the king of Sodom is a group of kings that made war against them and lost. And so if you look at verse 2 in chapter 14, it said, These made war with Bera, king of Sodom, Bersha, king of Gomorrah, Sinab, Shinab, king of Adma, Shemeber, king of Zeboim, and the king of Bela, which is Zoar. So these are the kings. The, uh, how many kings are there? One, two, three, four, five kings. Five kings in the valley of the Jordan who have gathered together in a confederate to fight against Chedorlaomer and all the fellows that come over from the east. Now, Chedorlaomer and all of those men had laid tribute upon the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah and all those kings and those cities there in the Jordan River Valley, laid tribute on them. And then, that's fascinating, isn't it? Because so long ago, you have men in kingdoms six, seven, eight hundred miles away from Palestine, and they're imposing their power on Palestine. It's not like they had airplanes and battleships. They had to do this by foot and animal. They had to come all the way over to impose their rule. And so the kings of Sodom, Gomorrah, Zeboim, all those cities paid tribute. Every year they paid tribute to these kings who were way over in Mesopotamia. Or I should do like this, way over in Mesopotamia. Because if you're looking at the map, Mesopotamia would be over here to the east. So they're way over there in Mesopotamia, and these kings for all those years paid tribute. Then they decided in the 13th year, we're not going to do that anymore. Let them come over here and force us. And, of course, they did. 
Now, Abram, it says, came back he, after his return. It says there in verse 17. So Abram came back leading his coalition, which included his neighbors. In chapter 14, verse 13, it said, There came one that had escaped and told Abram the Hebrew, for he dwelt in the plain of Mamre, the Amorite, brother of Eschol and brother of Aner. And these were confederate with Abraham. So Abraham has led a group of men to rescue Lot from the Sodomites, or from uh, Chedor Laomer. They had taken him captive and were going to take him back to Mesopotamia. We know about that story, don't we? That, but now it's happening in Abraham's time. So he goes and he rescues Lot. He gathers together, it's, the scripture tells us here in chapter 14, that Abraham himself had 318 trained men. These are men who could draw the sword. These are men who are old enough to draw the sword, who are able to draw the sword. This doesn't include the old men and the young men who were there in his camp. Can you imagine how large a gathering that Abraham has? His family, his servants, all of these people, and he has 318 that he can just pick up in a moment and say, gather your equipment, let's go. 318. Now, that doesn't include however many Mamre had and however many Eskel had and however many Aner had. They had men too. So all of these four gather together their forces and they go after Chedor Laomer and the folks that came from the east. It says that Abraham returns from the slaughter of Chedor Laomer and the kings that were with him. And these are the kings from the east and they came with this large contingent. We have, how many? Four, four princes here. Notice verse 1 of Genesis chapter 14. It says, It came to pass in the days of Amraphel, the king of Shinar, Arioch, the king of Elisar, Chedor Laomer, king of Elam, and Tidal, king of nations. Fascinating that we have this group from Mesopotamia coming all the way over into Palestine to project their power on the Palestinian cities. Amraphel who's the king of Shinar. Shinar is that area of South Mesopotamia. This is where Abraham was from, Ur. The Chaldees is there in that area called Shinar. You'll notice another important place, uh, Chedor Laomer's king of Elam. Elam was east of Mesopotamia in the area that we would call Persia. It's the place where Iran is today. So they were neighbors to uh, Shinar. And there's an important city there in Elam that we know of, and we're going to read about it eventually, and that is the city of Susa. It was a palace city. It was the winter palace for the Persian kings later on. And then you have these others that are mentioned, um, Arioch, king of Elisar. Don't know where Elisar is. Some think it may be there in south Mesopotamia. And then Tidal, king of nations. Uh, don't know where that is either. It, Maybe someone is actually doing work on that today, but king of nations, maybe it's a place, maybe this is just a title, don't know. But this king comes, and so you have this confederacy from the east, and they come all the way over into the Jordan Valley. And if you read chapter 14, it's amazing what it tells about them. It says they come in, and they just destroy everything. They come in, and it says they destroyed the Zuzims. And they destroyed the Emims. The Zuzims and the Emims were both families of the giants. And so they went to their capitals and they destroyed them. On their way down to, Jordan, the, down to Jericho and, and um, Gomorrah and Sodom and all those cities down there, Zeboim, Jericho probably wasn't a city then, but all of those cities are down there and they just destroy everything as they come down. They, they're, they're, and they're killing the giants as they do this. So they have quite a force. And you can imagine when they get down to Sodom, Gomorrah, and all those men, and they fight this fight in the valley of the assault pits, and they have this fight, and they destroy the kings, and they take the people and all the stuff, and they, they're going back home. So they just head back north. Abraham hears about that and gathers his, his men, and they follow them all the way up to Dan, which is in the northern part of Palestine. So there's a lot of travel that goes on here. Abraham is victorious. He comes back, and it says that he's in the Valley of Shiva, which is the king's dale. This is on the east side of the Jordan. So this is over north, just north of where Sodom and Gomorrah would have been. So he goes all the way over there, and when he gets there, he's met by somebody wonderful. He's met by the king of peace. Look at verse 18. 
and Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine. Okay, so who is this fellow uh, Melchizedek? Well, he is, says here that he's the priest of the Most High God. The Hebrew name Melchizedek translates to king of righteousness, and this is something that the writer in Hebrews mentions. So if you have your Bible there in your lap or your electronic edition of that, uh, turn to Hebrews chapter 7, and you'll see that the writer of Hebrews deals quite a bit with this fellow by the name of Melchizedek. You'll notice that he begins, uh, the writer of the Hebrews begins talking about Melchizedek there in chapter 6 at the end. Whither the forerunner is for us entered, even Jesus, made an high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, high priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him, to whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all, first being by interpretation king of righteousness, and after that also king of Salem, which is king of peace, without father, without mother, without descent, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like unto the Son of God, abideth a priest continually." And consider how great this man was, unto whom even the patriarch Abraham gave the tenth of the spoils. And verily they that are the sons of Levi who receive the office of the priesthood have a commandment to take tithes of the people according to the law, that is, of the brethren, though they come out of the loins of Abraham. But he whose descent is not counted from them received tithes of Abraham and blessed him that had the promises, and without all contradiction the less is blessed of the better. Isn't that marvelous? So here we are told that we have this beautiful commentary here in Genesis chapter 7 about the man Melchizedek. He's the king of righteousness. He's the king of peace, the king of Salem. Now Salem was Jerusalem. So he probably came from that area where Jerusalem is all the way to the east, across Jordan, all the way over into the valley of the kings. Melchizedek comes. He blesses Abraham and he says, uh, he says there, bless, he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram of the Most High God, possessor of heaven and earth. Now this is a restatement of uh, what God had already said to Abram in chapter 12. You read chapter 12 this week. And in chapter 12 we have the covenant that God made with Abraham. And if you look at chapter 12, if you're right there in Genesis, just notice the word bless and how many times it's used here in Genesis chapter 12. The Lord said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country from thy kindred, from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee. This is verse 1. And I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse them that curse thee, and, thou, and in thee all the families of the earth shall be blessed. How many times is that word used? You will be a blessing. I will bless you. You will be a blessing to others. Anybody who blesses you will be blessed. God is doing a work for Abraham. And so when the, uh, when the king of peace comes out, Melchizedek, and he says to Abraham, Blessed be Abraham of the Most High God, possessor of heaven and earth. I wonder if Abraham sitting there thinking to himself, Yeah, that's exactly what God said. He said I was blessed. And maybe this is proof that I've been blessed. Because he gave me the victory in this battle. This is a restatement and a recognition of what God had already said to Abraham. And we might call this also a confirmation of what God had said to Abraham. And perhaps, ladies and gentlemen, Abraham needed to hear somebody else say it. Perhaps Abraham needed to hear this from someone like this fellow Melchizedek. Who is he, by the way? I believe he's none other than the Son of God pre-incarnate. He comes with wine, it says, and he comes with bread, and he blesses Abraham. David said of Melchizedek that the Messiah, there in Psalm 110, he said that the Messiah would be a priest after the order of Melchizedek. It says that Melchizedek is without days. It says that he's without mother and father, but he has no beginning and no end. And only one can match that description, and that is the Lord Jesus, for he is God. And so we see 
I think, the pre-incarnate Christ here in Melchizedek. And it isn't wonderful. He doesn't come out asking Abraham for anything, but he gives. He provides. He blesses. In Josephus' history, Josephus says that when Melchizedek came out and blessed Abraham, that he provided a meal for all of Abraham's men. Mamre's men, Eskel's men, Aner's men. Everybody ate because Melchizedek came out and took care of that. He blessed everybody that day, but specifically Abraham. And he said, blessed be Abraham of the Most High God, possessor of heaven and earth. And, of course, as we read in the book of Hebrews, the writer of the book of Hebrews said that uh, his descent not counted for them that received tithes, and with, he, he goes on to say there in chapter, in verse 8 of chapter 7, without all contradiction, the less is blessed of the greater. So Abraham, being the less, is blessed of the greater Melchizedek. This is none other, I think, than the pre-incarnate Christ. And notice verse 20. It says, And blessed be the Most High God, which hath delivered thine enemies into thine hand. Melchizedek quickly focuses exactly what has happened and framed it exactly right. God had done this. Abraham is blessed, and because Abraham is blessed by the Most High God, God did this for Abraham. Abraham didn't do it. God delivered the enemies into Abraham's hand. This is a fulfillment of the promises that the Lord made with Abraham at the beginning, right there in chapter 12, because he said in chapter 12, those will be blessed who bless you, those will be cursed who cursed you. And all the people will be blessed because of you. Shador Laomer and the boys, when they came over, had no covenant right to the land because God had given the land to Abram. He had no covenant right to take Lot and all that was his. Lot, oh, now, Lot should not have been living in Sodom. That's a sermon for a different time. But there's a principle here higher than where Lot was living, and that was who he was. Lot was living in Sodom, yes, and he shouldn't have been there, yes. But who was he? He was the nephew of the covenant bearer. I wonder if Chedor Laomer had come down into the Salt Valley and had had that attack on the kings, but he just left everything and went back home. If he hadn't taken Lot, Abraham probably wouldn't have cared. It's just one group of kings on another group of kings. It doesn't have any effect on him, but Lot was taken. That made a difference. Blessed be the Most High God, which hath delivered thine enemies into thine hand. The principle here is that Lot was the covenant bearer's nephew, and that, ladies and gentlemen, made a difference to Abraham. And then after this blessing, after he blesses Abraham and he blesses God who delivered the enemies of Abram into his hand, he Abraham, it says here, gave him tithes of all. Notice Abraham's response right there in verse 20. Abraham gives tithes of all. Abram's response to the Son of God, to Melchizedek's blessing, is to give back to him by tithing. He gives him a tenth of all that he, was, that all that he had taken. Now, Hebrews tells us in verse 4, Consider how great this man was, unto whom even the patriarch Abraham gave the tenth of the spoils. And this wasn't just anything. This wasn't just an abundance and overflow. No, this prey was precious because it had been gathered at a high cost to the men who went with him. It was significant to Abraham. Tithing should always be a gift that is meaningful. It should always proceed from the soul rather from the abundance of the pocketbook. 2 Corinthians chapter 8 tells us that the um, Macedonians says that in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded unto the riches of their liberality. They gave when they really didn't have the means to give, but they gave because they wanted to worship the Lord with their giving. In 2 Samuel chapter 24, David gives us this principle in a figure because he tells Aruna that he won't buy the threshing floor. He says, Nay, I will surely buy it of thee at a price. Neither will I offer to burnt offerings unto the Lord my God, which cost me nothing. So David bought the threshing floor and the oxen for 50 shekels of silver. This gives us quite a, quite a, um, quite a, 
point of reference here when it comes to tithing. It's coming from the heart. It's meaningful. It's not something that we just do offhand, but it's a part of worship. That's what we, that's what we, that's how we should see tithing, a part of our worship. This also points to the fact that tithing, like Sabbath observance, are devotional practices that predate the giving of the law. A lot of people will say, oh, well, we don't need to observe the Sabbath, and oh, we don't need to tithe because those are things that were instructed in the law. That's right, they were, but they were long before the law. Sabbath observance and tithing were being practiced. The law didn't institute it. It was already being done. Abraham does it. Jacob does it. We find it in the Old Testament prior to the law. The law just takes it and says, let's just keep doing this. And so Abraham gives him tithes. Why does he do this? This is the only thing that we see Abraham doing with the king of peace. He gives him tithes of all. He blesses and worships God by giving what he had been given. Isn't that beautiful? And then we have the king of Sodom. Now we've talked about the character of Melchizedek. He's the king of righteousness. He's the king of Salem, which means peace. He comes from the city of the kings and of peace. And here comes the king of Sodom. What's his character like? Well, it says the king of Sodom was there, and he approaches Abraham. And let's think about the king of Sodom for a second and entertain just a few witnesses that can tell us about this king. First is in Genesis chapter 13, in verse 13, it says, The men of Sodom were wicked and sinners before the Lord exceedingly. I read that and I thought to myself, that's fascinating that it would use both of those words. And I went to the Hebrew text and sure enough, it has, it has wicked or evil and sinners. And I thought to myself, can you be wicked and not be a sinner? Can you be a sinner and not be wicked? But he emphasizes both wicked and sinners before the Lord, greatly, it says, exceedingly. That's the way that verse ends in the Hebrew sentence, is with that word exceedingly or very muchly. We might want to translate it that way. This is the way the Lord saw them. This is his witness of the people of Sodom. So if this is the witness of the men of Sodom, what's the king like? He's king of that place. Josephus says of them in his history, in the Antiquity of the Jews, he says, quote, At this time, when the Assyrians had dominion over Asia, the people of Sodom were, a flourishing, were in a flourishing condition, both as to riches and the number of their youth. He goes on to say, quote, About this time, the Sodomites grew proud on account of their riches and great wealth. They became unjust towards men, impious towards God, insomuch that they did not call to mind the advantages they received from him. They hated strangers. They abused themselves with sodomitical practices. Also, the antiquity of the Jews. Peter also speaks of the corruption of Sodom. In 2 Peter chapter 2, he says, Turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemn them with an overthrow, making them an example unto all those that after should live ungodly. And delivered just Lot, vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked. For that righteous man dwelling among them and seeing and hearing vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. Now I want to say to Lot, why are you living there then? Don't you? Why are you living in Sodom if you're vexed from day to day? But then I think of myself, every time I turn the TV on anymore, I'm vexed. Every, I can't watch an NFL football game now without being vexed. We only need to read about Lot's experience with the angels to remember the horror of living in that place. And this is what the king of Sodom represented. And then, as the old fellow said, he opens his mouth and removes all doubt. Notice what he says to Abraham. Give me the persons and take the goods to thyself. Give me the persons, or really, maybe should be translated, the souls. Give me the souls and take the goods to thyself. Why would he say this to Abram? Why? Compare his words, 
here, the king of Sodom, to what Melchizedek said and did. The king of Salem brought in bread and wine. What did the king of Sodom bring? He gave a blessing, and he led the gathered in worship by blessing God, which led Abraham to give a tenth in worship. But this king wanted the people. Of course he did. He was a sodomite. The flesh of men was his theater of operations. He wanted to control them. He wanted to lead them back to Sodom, abuse and dominate them for his own pleasures. Sodomites abound in our day as well, and they demand the same thing. Ladies and gentlemen, we don't live in a day when sodomy is in the shadows. Oh, no, no. It is in the bright lights of the theater now, circled with pretty lights and painted in pretty colors. Yeah, there's a lot of lipstick on sodomy today. It is everywhere. And so what is Abraham's response to this request of the king of Sodom? Abraham says to the king of Sodom, and that begins there in verse 22, I have lifted up mine hand unto the Lord, the most high God, the possessor of heaven and earth, that I will not take from a thread even to a shoe latchet, and that I will not take anything that is thine. Notice this word. He begins with worship. He says, I lift up my hand unto the Lord, the most high God, the possessor of heaven and earth. And notice that this is the exact same way that Melchizedek referred to the Lord. He said that very thing about God, the possessor of heaven and earth. And then he goes on to say, I will not take from a thread even to a shoe latch. Why would he say this? Why would he say this? Because Abraham knew who he was. Abraham was not afraid to give the tenth to Melchizedek. He wasn't afraid of that. That was done in worship. That belonged to the Lord. But now, no, he's not going to take anything from this man. Not at all. Be careful, ladies and gentlemen, who you associate with. Abraham wanted nothing that the sodomite had because it was associated with him. And Abraham knew what would happen. Notice what he says there in verse 23. Lest thou should say, I have made Abram rich. Abram knew who had made him rich. It was the Lord God who had made him rich. And if he had taken anything from Bela, the king of Sodom, he would have latched on to Abraham's success. And Abraham's name, or Abram's name, would have been on Bela's resume. Oh, I helped Abraham. Look at what I did for Abraham. Do you think Abraham wanted his name on the sodomite's resume? No. No, he didn't. Because Abraham is a righteous man. He loves the Lord God. He doesn't want any part to do with the wickedness and the sinning that was going on under the hand of this fellow, Bela of Sodom. But Abraham says here in verse 24, Save only that which the young men have eaten, the portion of men which went with me, Aner, Eskel, and Mamre. Let them take their portion. He thinks of the welfare of those who went with him. While he was willing to impoverish himself, he wasn't willing to do the same to his friends. And so he said, they can have whatever they want. Let them take it all. But I'm not going to take anything from you. But these men hazarded their lives to bring these folks back. Let them have what they want. I won't. So how do we apply this? We, like Abraham, live in between the king of peace and the king of Sodom. We do. We are in the valley of the kings today. Abraham was a king. He'd never called that. But, I mean, you look at the confederacy that he led, Mamre, Eskel, and Aner, and his men. We have the kings of Palestine right here. And they're there in the vale of kings with the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah and all the rest and having destroyed the kings from the east, Chedeliomer and Tidal and all those fellas. We live right there between Melchizedek and Bela. To whom do you give tithes? If you're a Christian, you, like Abram, are a king, journeying in a land filled with Canaanites who despise what you stand for. 
That's what we have to deal with in the Valley of the Kings. These people will tempt you to give them what they want in exchange for the vanities of the world. Just give me the people and keep all the rest. Now, it's time for us to learn how to say no to those folk. It's time for us to turn our backs on their offerings and to make sure that we are not stained by their reputations. As I said, sodomy is no longer in the shadows. We don't even have to talk about it in uh, illustrative terms any longer because we see it everywhere. It is the head now of all the wickedness that is going on in our country. And I dare say, I think that it would be good for people in the White House and in the Senate and in the Congress to read about what happens to Sodom and Gomorrah in chapters 18, 19, and 20, because we're headed down that same path. If you're a Christian, you have a powerful ally who comes bringing bread and wine. Do you know who he is? He's there in the Valley of the Kings as well. While the king of Sodom is beckoning you to come and give to him what he wants, the king of peace comes offering you bread and wine. The king of peace comes reminding you that you're blessed by the God of heaven. The king of peace comes and he offers you encouragement for the struggle. The maker of heaven and earth encourages you to praise him in the midst of the struggle and to walk according to his way. Powerful ally, the Lord God of heaven, he comes. And you know, that's one of the wonderful things about doing this Bible reading because it gives us a moment every day, maybe for 10 minutes, maybe for five minutes, however long it takes you to read two, three chapters, just a moment, just a moment in our day, we get to sit down with the King of Peace and listen to him speak to us from his word. Marvelous. You have an opportunity before you to worship him with all that you command. You have an opportunity to say no to the king of Sodom. You have an opportunity to say yes to Jesus Christ. It's your opportunity. You too walk in the valley of the kings. Who will you listen to? Jesus will meet you. Thanks for listening to this week's message. Please join us again next time for another installment of the Creek Road Baptist Pulpit.